Is there enough room in hell? And is Abraham supposing a waiting room? Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Uh, in our last video that we did on talking about hell, did Jesus burn in hell? I called it a waiting room. Abraham's bosom a waiting room. But what does the Bible actually call it? And uh, a sister in Christ made a really good point, and she brought up a verse and asked me about a certain verse, and we're going to go through it. Is there enough room in hell? Okay. In the last day we did, we talked about why I made this so much bigger, the lower hell from Abraham's bosom, because we're going to read the passage about um, narrow is the way that leadeth to life everlasting, but broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, many there be that go there and at it. Why is hell so big? Okay. So turn in your Bibles, your King James Bibles. Okay. I put the key, my Bibles right here, if you can tell. I put them right where this gulf is. Why? Because what separates the people in Abraham's bosom from the people in the lowest hell in the Old Testament? God's Word. Those who kept it, those who did not. You know what separates people in the lowest hell from people in heaven? God's Word. Those that kept it, those that did not. People say, are you teaching works? No, I'm talking about, and Peter talks about, receive the engrafted Word which is able to save your soul. Where do we get the Gospel from? The Word of God, the King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English. Okay. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Okay. The Bible talks about how we're to obey the gospel. It talks about if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Why? Because they reject God's word. They reject the record that God gave his son. And this is the record that God hath given us that we have eternal life, and it's in His Son. The record that God gave. Uh, the other one is, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life. We can know we're saved and get to have eternal life. We're sealed into the day of redemption. But the last part of that verse people like to leave out, it says, And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. It's because of a perfect written record, God's Word, that we're able to believe the Gospel. What separates people in hell today from heaven? God's Word. What separates Abraham's bosom, lowest hell? People in the Old Testament that kept God's Word. Amen. <clears throat> just want to throw that out there. That's why I put them here between the two. All right. Make sure you have your King James Bibles. Turn to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 11. And we're going to go through and we're going to read this passage that talks about how big hell is. Okay, Because a question got brought up. Isaiah 5.11, I'm sorry if I, it's cold this morning, that's why I got my hat on and the sweater and everything. It's cold this morning. We had two days where it got up to 100 degrees on the deck, 90 something degrees on the deck, and then all the clouds came in, it started raining, and the temperature dropped greatly. So we're back to being somewhat cold. It's not as cold as winter, it's still springtime, but spring here on the, on the coast, it just... The weather is so dramatic on the coast. One day it can be up to almost 100 degrees. The next day it won't even get up to 60 to 70 degrees. So it's very different on the coast. Isaiah 5.11 Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink. What does the Bible say about getting drunk and strong drink? That continue until night to wine and flame them. And the harp and the vial, the tabret and the pipe and the wine are in their feasts. Almost sounds like a nightclub. But they regard not the work of the Lord. How do we know what the work of the Lord is today? God's perfect written word tells us. Today there's a lot of people, be careful, with good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. What's, what, do I call the, what I call people that are simple are people that don't know God's word. They deceive you. They say, this is a good work. This is a work of God. We say chapter and verse, and when they can't find it in the Bible, that's not what this is talking about, the work of the Lord. Where is it at here? That's the hardest thing today. Today, there's a lot of, a lot of the Babel buildings. I call them Babel buildings, church buildings. It's all based off traditions of men, rudiments of the world, philosophy, paganism, social club. All this so-called, we're doing great works for the Lord. 
has no basis in Scripture. And you have these guys here. They regard not the work of the Lord. We're going to do things our way. And we're going to have fun. I had a lot of easy believism. Just a little side note. I had a lot of easy believism people. Faith alone, faith alone. They got mad at me when I did that study on fun. Where is it at in the Bible? The word fun doesn't appear in the Bible at all. And you look at the world's definition of fun, fun is flesh. Flesh is fun. The Bible says we can have joy today. We can have joy in the work in our hands. We can have peace. We can have happiness. But where does it say we can have fun? Like the, our soul and our spirit are supposed to get along with the flesh and let the flesh have fun. Let the flesh get out of control. It's not there. They got mad when I said chapter and verse. A lot of people do. Right? But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operations of His hands. His hands. I want to point that out. Brother says, Christ, how many of you are giving God the glory? I was dealing with somebody that, I love Peter Ruckman. He's a great preacher. He's a great teacher. I learned a lot from the man. But some people elevate him up to God's status. And they worship the man as a lowercase g God. And they're giving him all the glory and all the praise. And I'm like, I was just talking to somebody in one of the comment sections. And I was like, he's a great preacher, but why aren't you giving God the glory? Why don't you say, thank God for using this man. Thank you, Lord, for showing me the truth through this man. It's always, this man, he preaches nothing but truth. This man is so great. He's the best teacher. And it wasn't just with Peter Ruckman. There's other men on YouTube that they puff him up too, and they get the attitude of, it's all me. They take all the glory. They don't give it to God. Neither consider the operation of his hands. God's the one that sends people here. God's the one that sends people to Abraham's bosom in the Old Testament. God's the one that sends people to heaven. God runs hell. God runs Abraham's bosom. And of course that people will agree God runs heaven. But one of the, the, the things that we get away from, brothers of Christ, is you have people teaching that Satan runs hell. Demons run hell. No, God runs everything. The work of His hands. Okay. Verse 13, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. My people are gone into captivity. This is talking about the Old Testament. But it kind of reminds me of this place here. When we get to the real name of what this place is, it's Abraham's bosom, but what it's also called. They're in captivity. My people are in captivity. Verse, 13, verse 14, here's what we get it. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Enlarged herself. It gets bigger and bigger as more people end up getting going down here. They talk about more and more millions of people today. Every year, millions of people are, are pouring into hell. They reject the true plan of salvation, which we're going to get to in a second. But more and more of them are just going into hell. And hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp... And he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. It's in the earth. All this is hell, and it's in the earth. The lower hells is where you see corruption. Abraham's bosom, there is no corruption. But it's all in hell. Okay? Descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. Brothers says Christ, we know this, but the world doesn't seem to get it. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's going to be judging everyone. Anyone that's down there, anyone that's in heaven, he's the judge. All right. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God shall... God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Okay. Now here's the question. Through all that, I'm sorry to talk about little things here and there, but the biggest thing that we're going to watch is, therefore hell hath enlarged herself, brother Christ. Hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Now here's a question. Why was hell enlarged? 
The first question you'd answer is say, well, because there's a lot of people going there. But the first question I would ask is, who was hell, who was hell created for? God had hell all set up for a certain group of people. It was all set up, perfect size, didn't have to enlarge itself or nothing. It was like, what was that? Turn to Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye accursed, in everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Why does hell have to enlarge itself? Because death entered the world. Getting a little ahead of myself. Now, hell, then the lake of fire, was created for Satan and the fallen angels. Remember, we had fallen angels before the flood. They left their first estate. They're reserved in chains in hell right now until the day of judgment. Then, which hasn't happened yet, we're going to have the catching away of the body of Christ. You have that red dragon with his tail. He, in Revelation, he draws a third of the stars to, to earth. There's those fallen angels. See, God already prepared hell for Satan and his angels. That's why it was created. It wasn't created for mankind. And here's a couple examples of why did hell enlarge itself. It wasn't created for us. But when death entered the world, when did death enter the world, brother and sister Christ? Adam and Eve. They were told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They did. What happened? Death entered the world. The law of sin and death entered the world. Okay. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. This is where it happened. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. To this very day, we're going to be doing another video, Brother Jesus Christ, talking about the Yea, hath God said game. And a better rendering would be game. I believe the first point, uh, first, I believe the first step to the falling away that we've been talking about lately, brothers in Christ, is people, brethren having no problem adding to and subtracting from the Word of God. And this has been happening for the last, what, 100 to 200 years? They have no problem adding to and subtracting from the Word of God. Even the most die-hard, Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries, that's why I call this ministry Bible-believing, God-fearing, um, out there, great men of God, the great proponents of the King James Bible is God's perfect written word. Every last one of them has been guilty of adding to the word of God and subtracting from the word of God and digging their heels in and not budging. I've been caught. Brother Chris, this is Christ. I've been caught. I, I hate to use the word caught like I'm trying to sneak it past you. No. Someone has brought it to my attention that I'm PWCing. I said something that someone else, I learned from someone else. It sounded good. It sounded great. So I passed it along, and when they hit me up and said chapter and verse, I couldn't find it in the Bible. And my attitude is, is I want to line up with the book. Okay? I want to line up with this book. So what do I do? I drop it, and I start lining up with this book. Terms that aren't in the Bible, words that aren't in the Bible, studies that aren't in the Bible, I drop them, and I want to line up with this book. But you have every great man of God out there, there will be another study, that they would dig their heels in, and they wouldn't budge. They wouldn't line up completely with this book. Okay? They played the yay hath God said game and tried to get away with it. And they got caught. They got caught. Okay? I was corrected. Okay? Um, and I, like I said, we repent and we line up with the book. Uh, they're playing the game of a better rendering would be. Well, the Bible says this, but we can also say it this way. A better rendering would be. But the yea hath God said game has been going on since the very beginning. Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, Ye may eat of the fruit in the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the, fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die spiritually. Right? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Yea hath God said. No, you should not surely die. No, you don't have to follow. You you don't have to follow God's plan of salvation. You don't have to come to God on His terms and do things His way. You know how many people down here said, "Don't fall for it." They're probably yelling, "Don't fall for it!" I fell for it. Don't fall for it. They told me repentance isn't part of salvation. They told me prayer wasn't part of salvation. 
It was only believe, only believe, don't fall for it. If they could send messages up here to their loved ones, they'd be saying, do it God's way. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Come to God with a broken and contrite spirit. They'd be screaming out. You will know you shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods. Every time you have someone playing, <coughs> pardon me, every time you have someone playing the yea hath God said game, a better rendering would be game, what they're really trying to say is, is I'm my own God, and I'm, so, I'm smarter than God. I'm better than God. God needs to be corrected. God needs to be updated. And I'm the one that's going to do it. So I'm my own God. Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay? Now remember, who was hell in the lake of fire created for? That serpent. The devil and his angels. This is where death entered the world. And I believe it started at the fall of Adam and Eve. That's when death entered the world. And that's when hell started having to enlarge itself. Why? Because you get to Genesis chapter 7, verse 17, the first time, I think it's the first time that a lot of people, all at once, went wound up here. So you might know where I'm going. Noah and the flood. Genesis 7, 17. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increasing greatly upon the earth, and the ark went up upon the face of the waters. Today, we go up. Those who are saved. Noah, his uh, son, three sons, his, Noah's wife and his three sons' wives, they were taken up above the destruction. Okay? Why is Abraham's bosom higher than lowest hell? Because they're above this. It's still captivity, but they're above hell. They're above the corruption, the destruction. But you see here, under the whole earth, and the waters prevailed exceeding upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heavens were covered. Fifteen cubits up, upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both fowl, and of cattle, and of beasts, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, all that was in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and fowls of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Hell enlarged itself. When that happened, well, the, only, the only person righteous was, in God's eyes, remember, righteous has two definitions. People try to... To do a uniform uh, definition, what, uh, every word can only have one definition. Don't fall for that lie, brother says Christ. Don't fall for it. Righteousness has two definitions in the Bible. There's righteousness that has to do with sinless perfection. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Righteous, sinless perfection. Then there's righteousness as far as having a right heart in God's eyes. Do you have a right heart in God's eyes? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee? Do you have a right heart with God? In the Old Testament, the Bible would call men righteous, not because they were sinlessly perfect, but because they had a right heart in God's eyes. They were also doing animal sacrifices. The blood was covering the sin, but they were right in God's eyes. Noah was right in God's eyes. He wasn't sinlessly perfect, but his heart was perfect before God. Not the flesh, not the body of flesh, but the heart was perfect before God. You can have a perfect heart. Okay? Remember that. But all those people, except for Noah, they were unrighteous. They were evil. They were wicked people. And they're just, when that happened, just pouring into hell. Hell had to enlarge yourself to accommodate people that weren't even supposed to go there to begin with. Hell wasn't created for them. Okay. 
See, another time hell was enlarged. Um, God was punishing Israel in Isaiah 5. When we're reading Isaiah 5, we're talking about Israel, telling many of them to hell. Man does not have to go there. Man does not have to go there, but many do. This was not created for us, brothers and Christ. Why is hell so enlarged? Is there room in hell? Absolutely. Don't think that you're going to get to hell. I'm talking about the lost world. Don't think you're going to get to hell and they're going to get there and go, Oh, there's just no more room. I guess I get a free pass to heaven. There's always going to be room. It's always enlarging itself to accommodate everyone that goes there. And everyone that goes there deserves to be there. There's not one innocent person in hell. Not one. Matthew chapter 7, this is where we're written. Matthew chapter 7. Enter you in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And it says, And many there be which go therein at. Hell hath enlarged itself. It keeps getting making more room for everyone that goes down there. Many there be that go therein at. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. The people that went over here, there's few that went to Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom isn't this huge place full of millions and billions of people. No, there's very few people here. There's very few people going to heaven compared to going to hell. How do we know this? Verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. You have to be seeking it. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Why? Because they're not seeking truth. They're not seeking absolute truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Is Jesus speaking? They're not seeking Jesus. They're not seeking absolute truth. They're not seeking God's word. They're not seeking to come to God on His terms. Very few there be that find it. You mean you have to seek it? Oh yeah. Salvation is something you have to look for. You say, God, show me the truth. He'll send somebody your way to tell you the truth and show you the truth. He'll have you come across this book, the King James Bible. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Why did I throw that in? Because today they're trying to change this. They're trying to change this. They're trying to change what happened here. They're changing the gospel. All right? Hell is just a grave. Hell is just annihilation. Hell is just a state of mind. It's not real. In Abraham bosom, you have uh, Catholicism tries to turn it into purgatory. But you're still burning up here. But that goes against the Bible. They saw no, no corruption up here. And there's no, there's no Abraham's, Abraham's bosom is probably still there, but we don't go to Abraham's bosom today. We go straight to heaven, or you go straight to hell. And those that go to hell, you don't get out. But like I said, all this gets messed up. Why? Because you have false prophets in the world trying to deceive people. Watch out for them. Romans 6.23, for the rages of sin is death. The law of sin and death, when death entered the world, that's when hell started enlarging itself. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Eventually they got to go up. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Today we don't go to Abraham's bosom. We go straight up. But the Old Testament you went here or you went here. For our study on did Jesus burn in hell. He came down to here and went up. He never went over here. Amen. Now brothers says Christ, for those that are lost... For the Bible says Christ, make sure you're preaching the true plan of salvation. Those that have a profession of faith that might come across this, or if you're just flat out lost. You don't have to go there. Hell was not created for you. It wasn't created for me. It was created for the devil and his angels. So if you go there, you're going to a place that wasn't created for you. You know how you can go to heaven? By following the true plan of salvation found in the King James Bible. Repent Toward, repentance towards God. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. You can have godly sorrow, or you can have worldly sorrow. 
You can't have both. You say, what's well, godly sorrow? I tried doing some videos on godly sorrow. Brother, sister, Christ, here's the best way. If I hurt you, okay, let's say I come and get in a fight and I say I punch you. Okay, I was talking to Brother Christ about slapping. Let's say I come up here and just slap you right across the face. I lose my temper, get in your face, and I slap you right across the face. And I'm just all happy and proud of what I did. You file charges for assault and battery. I go to prison, I pay a fine, I, I lose so much money that I end up losing my house, my wife leaves me, my kids don't look at me the same way again. These are consequences of my action. Now I'm sorry for the consequences. Oh, I'm just so sorrowful, but my, I have worldly sorrow. You ask me, do you regret hitting him? Oh heck no, if I had to do it again, I'd hit him twice. I hit him again, I hit him twice. That's the world. That's the wicked world today. That was me at one time. That if you're lost and watching it, that's you. You've got to get away from that and get to godly sorrow. That same scenario. I come across and I hit someone, punch them, slap them across the face. I come back later and say, you know what? I was wrong. I am so sorry for what I did to you. I regret ever doing it. I wish I never did it. I am so sorry. If you want to press charges, that is your right, and I deserve whatever's coming. I am so sorry for what I did. That's where godly sorrow comes in. You come to God going, I have sinned against you, Lord. I wish I'd, I regret sinning against you. I wish I'd never sinned against you, but I have. I'm wrong. I deserve whatever's coming. I deserve whatever's coming. Lord, I am so sorry that I've ever sinned against you, Lord. I'm wrong. You're right. I'm dirt, you're holy, Lord. I just, Lord, what must I do? I don't want to go here, Lord, but I deserve to go there. I'm so sorry. That heartfelt conviction, the broken spirit, the broken and contrite spirit, that's what true biblical repentance is. And that's when God says, I provided a way for you to get to heaven. I sacrificed my son on the cross. God's blood was shed on the cross. And that's when you start preaching the gospel. That's where the belief comes in. And the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. How he died for our sins. How he died for our sins. The sorrow gets magnified. He went through that because of me? He had his beard ripped out? He was beaten beyond recognition? They spit in his face? They jeered him? They called him names? They whipped him within an inch of his life? He was nailed to the cross where all his blood... He bled out on the cross and died because of my sins. Lord, I am so sorry. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he, was that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day, proving that He is God. I believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That Jesus' blood is God's blood and can wash my sins away, Lord. That's the second step. First step is repentance. You have to come broken. Second step is belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. What's the third step? Confess both in prayer. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You have to come to God on your knees, broken, and saying, Lord, I am a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell, Lord. I deserve to go to hell. For sinning against you. I should have never sinned against you. I was wrong. I'm so sorry, Lord. But I believe that you made a way for me to go to heaven. That you sacrificed your son on the cross to pay for my sins. And the blood that was shed was God's blood and it can wash my sins away. That he died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Lord, save me. That's the last step. Lord, I don't deserve it. Lord, please save me. Please, Lord, save me. I'm throwing myself, the old man, the Bible talks about how the old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The new man is raised with Christ. I'm throwing myself at the foot of the cross. The old man is being thrown at the foot of the cross. Lord, give, renew in me a new spirit. Give me a new life, Lord. Save me. Lord, please save me. And you know what? He will. 
He'll save you. Brothers and sisters of Christ, we know that hell wasn't prepared for us, but the lost world, they seem to be very scared of hell. And I made, remember making that point before. They're so scared of hell, they'll do anything they can to get rid of hell or change what hell is. But you know what they won't do? They won't ever fear the man, Jesus Christ, God manifest, God the Father manifest in the flesh. They won't fear the man that can send them to hell. They refuse to fear that man. They fear this. That's why they try to do away with it. But they don't fear the man that can send them to hell. They don't fear God. They don't come to God. What does the Bible say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, brethren out there that have a profession of faith, if you've never gone through the true plan of salvation, I suggest you get in this book. Because don't take my word for it. Get in this book and learn what the true plan of salvation is, which is what I just told you. If you've never come to God broken, oh, I believed, head belief, I believed. Or I got talked into saying a little prayer, I have the head knowledge, and I said a little prayer. There's a lot of false religions out there that believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. You know what separates us from them? They refuse to repent. A, they're not believing in the real Jesus Christ. They're, they're, their Jesus Christ is an antichrist. But they have the head knowledge that there was a, a man named Jesus Christ at some point in history that died for the, sin, for the sins of the world and was buried and rose again the third day. They have that knowledge but what keeps them from getting saved? They refuse to repent and follow the true biblical teachings of repentance. All repentance is just a work. What did we just read there about beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward they are ravening wolves? They want you to go here. Oh, just believe, only believe, only believe. All things are possible if you just only believe. What about repentance? Oh, that's just a work. What about repentance? Oh, repentance is just going from unbelief to belief, so that's why we don't even use it. You don't want to say believe and believe. Just say, that's too redundant. We'll just say believe. No, repentance is coming to God broken and having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you sinned against God, fearing the man that can send you hair. That's true biblical repentance. And that sorrow is magnified when you get told what Jesus Christ did because of those sins. Brother Jesus Christ, hell has enlarged herself because most people will reject the true plan of salvation. And they're going to wind up there. I, I'm going to be getting into an expository study here shortly. Because um, I disagree with the brother in Christ. Um, there's a difference between will someone go to hell or is someone destined to go to hell. Okay, Nobody's destined to go here. I don't believe in Calvinism, where you have people that are destined to go to heaven and people that are destined to go to hell, and there's nothing you can do about it. If while you're breathing, you can still get saved. Now, the better question is, is will they, people get saved? There's some very wicked people out there. Can they get saved, present tense? Yes, they can. All things are possible with God. But the better question is, will they get saved? Probably not. Hell hath enlarged herself. This is where most people are going, because they reject the true plan of salvation. They reject the Word of God. In the Old Testament, a lot of people went here. The people that went here were those that kept the Word of God. Okay. So if you're, uh, like I said, time's running out. For anybody that's watching this that's lost, time's running out. Hell is real. It's eternal. You're going to be burning for all eternity and suffering for all eternity. And you're going to have all eternity full of regret saying, why didn't I obey this book so I could go to heaven? What Jesus did for me on the cross so I could go to heaven. Like I said, if they could write letters to their loved ones in hell, they could, if they could tell the people today, their loved ones, what, that hell is real, and what it's like down there and how they, they can't change now. They can't get saved. It's too late. They're stuck there for all eternity. And they could warn people today. I doubt they'll listen. I honestly doubt they'll listen. I really do. Because the Bible talks about that. Remember the story about Lazarus and the rich man? Where the rich man saying, hey, send Lazarus up to tell my people. And he's like, if they don't believe the prophets, they don't believe the prophets that were doing signs and wonders. They didn't believe Jesus Christ that was doing signs and wonders? 
Do you think they're going to believe the one raised from the dead? I mean, Jesus rose, pe raised people from the dead. There was people in the Old Testament that were raised from the dead. There was prophets raising them from the dead. If they won't believe the prophets, if they won't believe this book as it is, God's Word, you can do all the signs and miracles and wonders you want. They won't believe because of that. They need to come seeking truth and seeking, truly seeking God. Not the God that they want, like they picture, okay, this is the God I want, I'm drawing a picture, I'm writing down all the rules and everything that I like and everything. Okay, this is the God I'm looking for. No, they say, I, I'm looking for the one true God. Show me him. Whether, I, whether it's what I want to hear, it's not about what I want to hear, it's about what I need to hear. I need to find the one true God. I need to find the one true way to salvation, to heaven. Not I want, I want, I want. It's I need, brothers and Christ. That's the problem. Okay? So, salvation. Hell was not prepared for us. Hell is enlarging herself. Yes, there's always room in hell. There's always room in hell. Okay? And speaking of room, where does Jesus say he, he went to, in my Father's house there are many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you. He's going to take us up. He's got a place prepared for us. Everyone that goes to heaven, there's room for, there's room for anybody to go to heaven. You just got to come to God on His terms. He's preparing a place for those of us who are saved. Remember, Brother Christ, this isn't our home. This is my home away from home. Remember, we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're in a foreign land. We're ambassadors in a foreign land. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. That's that new life that God gave us when we come to the cross. Okay. There is going to be a changed life after salvation. Okay? There's a guaranteed changed life after salvation. You say, well, some, I, I, I have pre preachers that don't teach that there has to be a, uh, a changed life after salvation. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward they are ravening wolves. They want you to go here. There is a guaranteed changed life after salvation. Okay? The Bible talks about resurrecting the old man, brothers and Christ. You can resurrect the old man. Absolutely. And you can start going back to looking like the world, acting like the world, and talking about the world, but you're going to be miserable. And there's going to be chastening of the Lord. But when you first get saved, God's going to hit you, and He's going to start making some changes in your life. The do's and the don'ts. You're going to start hiding God's word in your heart, like the Bible says. You're going to have a love for this book. I've seen it happen. Brethren, they get saved. They get on fire for the Lord, and they run 100 miles an hour. And sometimes that first wall they hit, they fall down, and they stay down for a good while. Okay? The Bible says, the Bible says, God knows them that are His. In God's house, there's not only gold and silver, but wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. There's times I've fallen flat on my face. But there was a changed life after salvation. I was not the same man. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Be careful of those wolves in sheep's clothing that want you to go here. They've deceived people in the faith alone, faith alone, nowhere in Scripture. Faith alone, belief alone, and they take repentance out, they even take prayer out, and then when there's no changed life, you still look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, then they tell you, oh, it's okay, it's normal, it's normal, you don't have to have a changed life. Why? Because they want you going here. They don't want you going to heaven. They want you going here, which is where they're going. There is a changed life. It's guaranteed. Amen. Sorry for getting a little off a little bit. Just wanted to preach the gospel every time there's an opportunity to preach the gospel. It's never too late. If you're still breathing, you can get saved. It is never too late. Right. The next part. I'm called, I called Abraham's bosom a waiting room. I called Abraham's bosom a waiting room. Forgive me, i got to get Victoria. Declan. Sorry about that, brother, says Christ. I called Abraham's bosom a waiting room. Okay. Is that correct? No, it isn't. But what does the Bible call it? 
What does the Bible call it? Right. It's me taking a correction. Acts 2.25. Acts 2.25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also, my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. It's talking about Abraham's bosom that's in hell. Not the lowest hells. Right. Thou hast ma made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. It was Jesus Christ that went down to get people from Abraham's bosom and take them up. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. But David's soul is over here. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. There's corruption over here, no corruption over here. 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, thereof we are all witnesses. God, I always point that out, God raised Jesus up. Remember that. Okay. If God the Father, I don't want to get it, it's the Godhead. If God the Father and the Son of God are not one and the same, then how can Jesus claim to raise himself from the dead? How does God the Father claim to raise himself, raise Jesus from the dead? And the Holy Spirit makes a claim that it raised Jesus from the dead. Why? Because they're all one and the same. The Godhead raised Jesus Christ from the dead. But Jesus hath raised God up, whereof we are witnesses. Remember, says Psalms 86, 13, For great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. King David didn't go to the lowest hell. He went to Abraham's bosom. Okay? Which is in hell. I just want to make that point that that's where we get these two places. They're in hell. They both are in hell. But here's the lower hell where you see corruption. This is Abraham's bosom where you don't see corruption. Okay? Now turn to 1 Peter 3.18. 1 Peter 3.18. Here's where we get a, a, what it calls it Abraham's bosom. And then we learn about Abraham's bosom when you uh, read Matthew. I think it's Matthew that talks about the rich man Lazarus, which we talked about in our study of did Jesus burn in hell. But 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. We just read God raised him up, but quickened by the Spirit. Remember what Jesus said? Destroy this temple. He's talking about himself. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. I will raise it up. Just a little side thing, though. The Godhead is truth. Trinity's pagan. Get away from the Trinity. Verse 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Is this, I called it a waiting room. Is it called a waiting room? No, it's actually called a prison. He led captivity captive. They're captive down here. They're trapped. They can't go to heaven. They, they're not going to go to hell, the lowest hell. But they can't go to heaven. They're prisoners here. Okay? Spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. And here's the good point. When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing... Were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. But this is Christ, the ark. Don't you remember the story of Noah and the flood? The ark? They were building the ark and told destruction was coming. And when they went into the ark, who closed the door? When he went to Abraham's bosom, God closed the door. You're stuck here until this happens. And when this happened, Jesus went down. What did he do? He opened the door. Noah in the flood. Who closed the door behind him in the, in the ark? God did. Who opened the door when it was time to come out of the ark? God did. Who opens doors and closes doors? God does. Right? They're prisoners. They're trapped here. And we already talked about this. If you haven't watched the study, please go watch the study about this isn't paradise. It's another false teaching. Abraham's bosom isn't paradise. 
They're prisoners. It's a, I called it a waiting area, but they're a prisoner, and they're in an area where there's no corruption. It's not the lowest hell, but they're still prisoners, waiting to be freed so they can go to heaven. Right? Which sometimes we're disobedient. Right? Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. In the Old Testament, they would do animal sacrifices to cover their blood, or cover their sins. They used blood to cover their sins. They went here, because it didn't take them away. In Hebrews 10.1 it says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continue make, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have... For then would they not have ceased to be offered? You do one sacrifice, you're good, right? No, they had to continually do animal sacrifices to keep covering their sins over and over and over and over. Because that the worshiping, the worshipers once purged should have not, should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. They had to continually do it. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. They had to continually cover those sins that kept coming back year by year by year by year. Today, brothers and Christ, after what Jesus did, the Bible says God is faithful to forgive us of our sins. If we repent, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today, when we fail the Lord every year, Every day sometimes it feels like we go to God and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me get back on my right path. Re uh, repent, forsake, and get back to your walk with the Lord. If, if any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Repent, forsake, get back to your walk with the Lord. That's how we do it today. In the Old Testament, because there's only one sacrifice, it is finished. In the Old Testament, it wasn't finished. They had to continually do sacrifices. Okay. Why? So they could go here, and it's a prison. They're prisoners. It was to keep them from going here. Okay. Uh, Hebrews 9.11, it says, But Christ being come, a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood I can turn the page. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption. Once. Once and done. It is finished. This was perfect blood. Okay. John 1, 29, Then the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The perfect sacrifice. Okay. This is not a waiting room. I said it was. It's a prison. I stand corrected. It's a prison. They're in prison, captured. They're in prison, and they're waiting to be freed. Okay. And that's the thing that gets me. It says they're prisoners, yet you have people that teach this is, this is paradise. If it's paradise, I don't need to go to heaven. I've got it made down here. It's a prison. It's not paradise. They, got set, they get to go to paradise. They were set free. Okay. It's the blood of God to, that washes their sins away. In the Old Testament, saints that went to Abraham's bosom had to do animal sacrifice to constantly cover their sins. But it didn't take them away. They were down, that's why they went down here. And I got to disagree with some brethren because some brethren believe uh, Nebuchadnezzar is a saved man. He's a saved Gentile. That he went down to here. When did, he, when did he acknowledge that God was the only true God and get rid of all the other false gods? That only God was true? When was he doing animal sacrifices to the, one, the most high God and only him so he could go down here? He never did. His sins weren't covered. He's not over here. He's over here. Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the man of sin, the son of perdition, that Antichrist that shall be the beast. That's what he's a type of. 
Okay? His sins weren't covered. And once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, okay, once again, they had to go to Abraham's bosom until God opened the door and let him out. Noah and his family had to go into the ark until God opened the door and let him out. Do you know they were prisoners on the ark? They couldn't get up and leave. They're prisoners on the ark. Once again, John 1.29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Okay. God raised up Jesus, Acts 3, 2.32. I will raise it up, John 2.9. That's Jesus Christ, but quickened by the Spirit, 1 Peter 3.18. Who raised Jesus Christ from the dead? After he went down to Abraham's bosom and set captivity captive, and it's a prison, the Godhead did of the King James Bible. So in the long run, I apologize. Victoria's back up to walking around again, so I'm sorry for the noise. Um, why does hell enlarge itself? Because hell wasn't prepared for us. And ever since death entered the world, there's been tons of people going to hell to a place that wasn't even prepared for you. Okay. Is this a waiting room? No. It's a prison. Okay. I have to stand corrected. It's a prison, and the prisoners had to be set free by the perfect sacrifice, which Jesus Christ did on the cross. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And thank you all for your prayers. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for the correction. And I pray you got something out of this video. I pray that it, let, it really broke someone's heart to truly get saved when we start talking about the gospel. Okay? Now is the time of salvation. Now is the accepted time. It's, you need to get saved now. Time is running out. So, I love my brothers and sisters of Christ. Please, please stay in the Word of God. Stay in prayer. And I'll see you in the next study.